What's up, guys? Welcome to another edition of Before the Whistle, presented by the Air Can Insurance Group. If your business is looking for the best in employee benefits, commercial property and casualty insurance, or retirement and 401k plan services, there's no one better suited to meet your challenges and build a plan centered around your needs than BRK Insurance Group. What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to Before the Whistle. I'm your host, Maddie Hudak, and I apologize for this episode on Tulane's 35-0 to 0 shutout over Navy coming a little late just because I wanted to see this team uh, and, and their focus and hear from the coaches and the players after that matchup. But, you know, like, hello, did someone call for some juice? Uh, th- that win was, I, I, as a defense person, shutouts, I never take one for granted. But, dear God, I mean, that wasn't just a shutout. It was a, a game-tackling, just, like, beatdown of an offense where, uh, you know, I don't think people realized how much bulletin board material they were handily providing Tulane all week leading up to this matchup. Uh, you know, how can they slow down this innovative, prolific Navy offense that no one can seem to contain uh, and their explosion in the passing and the running game. And, you know, it, it was fair enough to say those things, but this team took that personally. And that means that they, you know, really think that they ha- have the ability to record a shutout if you're going to take that type of stuff personally, but they did. And, you know, they, talk their talk. They walk their walk. They really have to talk. Um, In that opening possession, it was so clear, you know, three and out, they get five yards on offense for Navy. Tulane's defense was swarming like a pack of wolves, whatever you want to call it, uh, all towards the ball. And it was so clear immediately that, oh, wow. Okay. They are ready to go. Um, Then on the offense, they weren't as ready to go. We've seen that happen a few times this year. We've seen sometimes it take until halftime. Uh, it only took until, you know, the, the turnover awarded by the defense for the offense to come on in a really special way with Darian Mensa to me having a real breakout performance and adding an element to his game that we, you know, people have kind of been wanting to see all season long. But when he did so, you know, with on his terms and I think couldn't have come in a more perfect time, but really allowed him to just gain a level of confidence that proved to be the difference maker here in this matchup. Um, to me, it was really kind of adjusting on the fly and unsung heroes being kind of the theme of this game against Navy. You look back to talking about Dagan Bruno, the scout quarterback that played such an important role in this matchup. Uh, hearing from John Summerall today after practice, how you know uniquely important Caleb Thomas actually ended up being in this game, who Tulane used as a sixth offensive lineman. I asked, you know, it wasn't so much a throwaway question, but just kind of about that versatility, not re- realizing that that was kind of an urgent in-game uh, pre-game adjustment that I'm going to break down here all on today's show. I'm a defense person, so I'm going to start on that side of the ball for obvious reasons. Uh, that was one of the most impressive shutouts that I've ever seen, let alone for Tulane. I've witnessed three now. They had one earlier this year against Southeastern. They had one in 2022 against Kansas State, or Kansas State, Alcorn State. But both of those being FCS programs, this one being in conference play, it's their first conference shutout since beating Vanderbilt in the SEC in 1960. And it was their most lopsided victory in conference play since uh, shutting out LSU 46 to nothing in 1948. When we were in the Cotton Bowl year, we were talking about these records that were 83 years old. And to be getting back to that, it's it's a really great feeling, but it's just remarkable in the way that they did it, both in opponent and the complete three-level effort that we saw by Tulane's defense. Uh, I think that people didn't realize going into this game uh, how much bulletin board material they were kind of getting for Tulane's defense all week with the, and almost kind of Tulane's offense by extension, which I'll get to, but the whole coverage was how is Tulane going to shut down this prolific, uh, innovative, Navy uh, option team with a quarterback like Blake Horvath. And it was fair enough to have all of those questions. Uh, I feel like the injury to him was definitely underplayed. And then he just took some really hard hits from a really a defense that I would not want to play if I was an opposing offense. Uh, But that was a game where going into it, there was kind of looking at where the psychological edge was. Obviously I can only see Tulane's preparation on that side of things, but uh, that always kind of stuff matters where it, it was kind of, you know, how can Tulane be expected to stop this dam rather than, you know, let's look at how Tulane's defense has 
only allowed three points in the last couple of games that they played nine points. Um, and that's really the defense that you saw out there on the field, but it's a defense that's been preparing for this moment for a long time now. And probably longer than they were aware of, uh, you know, they've been working in these periods for the, you know, several weeks throughout the season now. And I'm not sure if the players are always totally in on that. Um, obviously that got ramped up this week, which I think was another huge edge for Tulane's defense was Dagan Bruno on the scout team, having that option offense. Um, you know, he ran split back beer at John Curtis high school. It's not the exact same concepts, but speaking with the safeties coach, Rob green, who gave me a lot of insight into really how, this matchup really unfolded, he was able enough to understand the basics to where he could focus on nuances that week. And when you hear about a scout team quarterback being able to apply nuanced scout looks for a team in all weeks, uh, that to me can't be ignored into giving Tulane a competitive edge here. And, and we kind of said he would end up being the unsung hero. And I mean, it was apparent from the opening drive where it was one of four three and outs Tulane had that day, and that doesn't include the one play forced fumble by Deshaun Batiste, rubber, recovered by Sam Howard. Um, the first three and out, I, I think, was kind of a moment where the players almost realized it in real time. Like, wow, we really know what's coming here. You could just see the reaction time on all three levels. That first drive for the Na uh, Navy offense, and that was with Blake Horvath starting as fresh as he was going to be uh, that entire game, gained five yards on three attempts. And the line just completely stuffed them every single time. But it was the fact that there were four players in the immediate vicinity the second the, the ball was snapped. You know, the Navy, when I was trying to watch their offense, I'm admittedly a defense person. And I'm, I'm like, what is happening really to a degree with half the players on that side of the ball going in motion? There's just a lot of stuff to fool you. But if you're not fooled and you're able to react quickly, I think Tulane really took advantage of what I would consider kind of a process delay almost of things taking a little extra second to get set and motion. And, and, you know, they do a lot of pitch plays that player has to get around him. By the time he was around him, Tulane was already you know at the quarterback's face or ready to stuff that uh, tackle for a loss. And I, you know, you saw the players kind of posting some stuff afterwards where, yeah, they did take it personally. And, you know, linebacker Sam Howard, who spoke with the media afterwards admitted as much, but, I think there was also a secondary personal thing there where like, we all talked about the military bowl. I certainly remembered the miserable conditions and I'm a sideline reporter on the side of the field. I, I can't imagine what it was like for the players that actually played in that game and you know, chip on the shoulder. It gave you know, a ton of them, including Darian Mensa who sat from the sidelines and I'll get to that side in a second. But you know, we heard that John Summerall held his team meeting on Friday in the hotel room he went around, he had everyone stand up that played in the military bowl that decided to stay. And he really went out of his way to thank those guys in particular, bringing in the guys then in the spring, they had no idea what they were getting into. The guys that were coming in the fall didn't have that much time to really get with the program at all. And yet they've been able to pull off what they've been able to, but I think really tapping into that emotion paid off for Tulane in this game. And I, I um, Talked, I think I talked about this in my preview episode for this matchup about you know, the psychology of choking, where it, where it hits a certain emotion level, where it matters to a degree, and it requires a certain level of skill. That's where you start to see those kind of things happen. I think if you're able to get ahead of that emotion, address it and make them feel it, and also make them feel prepared for the moment, that's where you get the perfect payoff that you saw from Tulane's defense, where maybe th there was no hope for them, especially after Horvath went out. But again, it really wasn't as if they were driving prior to that, where, um, you know, their first two drives, they back-to-back uh, -back punts. The next one, it's considered an interception. It was on fourth down, but I think Sam Howard still deserves the credit for that turnover, as he, he was rightly credited for. Sometimes they don't always do that, um, which Tulane turned into points. And I think that was kind of where things started to change, where that was where Darian Mensa ran things in. We've seen this defense really hold it down for the offense so many times this year, but the mental focus that this game really required from start to finish, it was so impressive to watch from the sidelines. I feel like I got such a great benefit in this game, especially of just being able to see how locked in everyone in every position group was sitting with their specified coach, going over the iPad footage when you know they're up 24 to nothing at that point, the Navy offense hasn't gotten anywhere on the field. And 
There was absolutely no checking out. It was as if their life was on the line every single time they went back out there. So again, recording three and outs as the game went on. And that to me, that's where you, I have not seen a two lane defense be both so focused and physically dominant. Uh, especially, you know, when you hear about Tulane Navy matchups in the past, this is the first one I've witnessed. They haven't played them in four years. It was always you know, Navy kind of beating up on Tulane. Even if Tulane was able to eke out a win, you look back to UCF losing to Navy in 2022 and being kind of beat up as a result of that game, everything starting to falter. They can be a spoiler for that reason. And they're a very disciplined team and it shows. It's just Tulane was almost that much more disciplined but they had every play read at the second it happened. You know, I, I went through and I charted this. There was 47 total tackles by 20 different players. And that was similar to the 22 players and 40 something or whatever tackles against Temple. This is a totally different opponent and totally different meaning when you look at how difficult of an offense this is going to be and how much we really heard about all three levels being so important, being able to take away the explosive passes. Because again, before... Blake Horvath went out there. There was nothing for him to throw to. And I had gone and charted how their tendencies were a lot of the time on earned first downs, they would kind of go for it and try one of their explosive passes. You know, maybe he was hurt enough that he wasn't able to even attempt that, but it just felt like they couldn't even get on a schedule to keep on. Uh, Tooling just kept them off the rocker from the get-go. That's kind of what Notre Dame did to them. It involved a lot of sloppy turnovers that piled up early, including on special teams. Yeah, there were two turnovers in this game, but it was almost just like the just by pure, it, not even pure will. It was the most like, we're just better than you and we're going to drain this out and not let you gain barely any yardage. I think they had something like 113 total yards. But of those 20 players or of those 47 tackles that included 20 different players, 13 of those tackles came from the defensive back room, nine from the two linebackers. And it was primarily the two starting linebackers that played in this game, Tyler Grubbs and Sam Howard whose return couldn't have been more timely, and then 25 on the defensive line. That's as balanced as you could ask for going into this game. And that is where you saw the gang tackling, where all, a lot of those were assisted tackles from multiple levels of the field. If they were barely able to get past the first level, where you saw multiple tackles for loss, batted down pass by Adonis Freelu, two sacks, two hurries. It was just the numbers don't even add up you know, and the sack and hurries and what have you category on how much bully ball Tulane was really doing on that side. And you have to go back to their phrase, see a little, see a lot. That phrase unlocked so much of what I think we saw out there, where there's so much that your eyes will look at. And as someone with ADHD, I honestly can't relate to a game plan more, where there can be a lot of noise that distracts you. But if you're able to find that one tendency, that one tell, focus on that one thing. And I, you know, this is just me giving a hypothetical there could be a play where there's so much motion going on, but you know, you notice just one way that it's either the way an offensive lineman is set, a certain split by the tight end when all that motion ends. If you're able to identify those kind of simplified things, then all of the motion becomes really meaningless. You're looking for that one key, that one tell. And I, I, it's clear to me that whatever those tells were, Tulane's defensive staff identified those really well. Like Greg Gasparato and, and Rob Green, we had heard that they had coaching experience against that offensive coordinator. I talked with Rob Green, his first game calling plays as DC at Warford, which is where both him and Gasparato played football. Uh, it was against the uh, this opposing OC. He was at one of the uh, FCS programs, either Mercer or I don't exactly remember, um, but it was one of those programs. And you know, he said he had some scars from that too, but they learned and took away from that that, you know, the, kind of the message, not only was it see a little, see a lot, but you know, don't give them layups or yeah, make them hit jump shots and contested threes and simplifying things again, like that, putting it in a different sport. I talk about soccer all the time on here. And I've heard, especially from younger people that, you know, their kids have listened in or whatever, that it sticks with them. I think there's something to be said about being able to give a message in you know different sport terms. And that message pretty much personified what they wanted to do out there where if Navy was going to beat Tulane, they were going to have to, you know, go one on one for their explosive plays, be able to beat them on those. But they weren't going to give them all these cheap, stupid plays, let themselves be beat by penalties and by missing assignments and poor leverage, poor tackling. You know, we heard about no one really being the hero in this game. And that's easier said than done. You know, when guys are 
trying to play and, and play to the best of their ability. Sometimes you just, you know, your instinct, you want to go make that play, but the discipline that they showed to stay within their assignments and completely shut out a, a service academy when none of them really have any experience playing against Navy, um, except for a few guys left from the 2020 team, maybe some guys uh, over in their previous programs, but the play speed at all three levels was incredible. And just the technique, focus, eye discipline, the way they leveraged and, you know, I'd say communication, but it was so seamless out there. It was like they all just kind of moved as this silent monster. And I think that all, it goes back to coaching. It goes back to the messaging, see a little, see a lot, but these players have totally bought in. We, I talked with Matthew Fobbs White. We spoke with him uh, with media today on Tuesday. And, you know, he is someone that has had an incredible breakout year. And you look at the growth from Kansas State until now, that game um, at Bandit, he really points to the coaching, but also the player ledness of this program and the buy in and the focus going into that week. It was so clear on the sideline that. The focus has not been more stout all year. And as you're building to a crescendo as the most important part of the year, including the final game of the regular season, that's where you really want to see all this stuff click on all cylinders. But, you know, you've, you've, the Tulane's played a lot of defenses this year where, oh, they have these two linebackers that lead the conference, lead the nation, lead this. But it really only goes down to those two players. I'm sure, again, you know, if some of these players wanted to get out of assignment, make some tackles, they might do so. There's a reason why they're winning football games and they're undefeated in conference play. And they are playing team first. And team first in this game led to a shutout. And that's as invigorating you can ask for for a team. The by, the uh, practice today, we're on a bye week. We were in the Saints facility. You know, it, they definitely play a little quicker in there sometimes. But the focus was so incredible that you can tell that they were all so aware of what happened in the last bye week against Rice. Not going to make that mistake again, but... For, uh, for all four seasons as a sideline reporter, it, I put that game up there with the Kansas State win. And coming away from this last game, I think it's hard for me not to give the edge to this Navy shutout just in how completely stifling every level of the field was. And you look at the fact that there's 20-something new starters on this team, 50 new roster players. That team had consistency. This team had absolutely no chemistry or familiarity with each other. They built that in season and through the bonds that they really spent time in practice and off the field working on, you saw that all pay off against Navy. <laughs> now, the reason I recorded the show, you know, a little late with it coming out on Wednesday was without having that Monday practice. Uh, I really wanted to see kind of what the team looked like going into this week, but I'm really glad that I waited because I, you know, what I thought was kind of an offhand question I asked John Summerall after practice today ended up being really illuminating into what was, you know, kind of an unsung hero in the win against Navy. Uh, you know, I kind of picked up during the game, one of my sideline hits was, I think it was either, I think it was the Alex Bauman touchdown pass, which, you know, was really interesting in the context of what I'm going to say. Uh, I did a hit noticing that Caleb Thomas was out there as a jumbo lineman. And a lot of the time when you bring out a 6 0 lineman, as we'd seen Tulane kind of do so in the past in the red zone, kind of telegraphs, you know, this is going to be a power run, jumbo run package, um, especially in short yardage. There's really only so much creativity you can use there. I noticed that they were using T Caleb Thomas fairly often in the run game, but not always running to his direction, almost kind of using him like a decoy. And then, you know, he was on the opposite side of where that passing play ended up going. And you know, I remember saying it was just really impressive way to kind of play off him. And so talking with coach Summerall after practice today, I brought that up and, you know, we kind of learned that Alex Bauman actually tweets something pregame uh, where he's expected to be fine. He said it was minor and he should play next week. Um, but it was kind of one of those surprise. Oh, I, I don't know if I can go right this second kind of things. Uh, and I had that honestly happen all the time with my ankle where like you just get a weird tweak in pregame and you're just not sure in that moment, whether or not you can go. And as a staff, you'd rather figure out, you know, and obviously Alex Bauman, he played in that matchup as we saw. So it was, you know, again, to hear that Caleb Thomas was essentially playing Alex Bauman uh, while Alex Bauman was catching a touchdown pass. It just goes to show how incredibly versatile he is. But, you know, we learned that John Summerall took the offensive staff, Joe Craddock, um, Evan McKissack, and Dan Rochar at offensive line, Teller spots over drawn at tight end and brought them all, you know, into the locker room and, like what, what's kind of the game plan here to manufacture tight end runs and Caleb Thomas ends up being the answer there 
where, you know, they ran a little more jumbo than they might have expected to win that game. But the versatility of a, a, a player like that, where you know, Caleb Thomas has played guard, center, tackle. He comes in fairly often during games, but I, I've seen him at all of these roles since 2020. He 100% is a hunt, unsung hero in this game. Then, you know, I kept kind of learning more interesting things. Uh, uh, Gary Smith talked with Darian Mensa about their relationship in high school. I, I didn't realize that they, they had such a close one. And he mentioned that Caleb Thomas actually played tight end in high school. That stuck out to me with the question that we asked. I asked Coach Sumrall. And, you know, I, I go out and look just to see what was kind of going on. And, you know, yeah, he had a... Um, an injury breaking his thumb and it prevented him from playing tight end as he couldn't catch passes. So instead he moved to offensive guard and here he is. Uh, that is pretty incredible. Just again, in the context of something like that, where, you know, Reggie Brown was already on limited snaps because of an injury he had against Charlotte. And so to put all of the, you know, really all of those responsibilities on Caleb Thomas to an extent, just goes to show really why he's always available on game days and you know, Coach Savarali said in his answer, he's like, you know, it's a guy whose name is not going to go on social media. And I want to break that by starting off this offensive section by rightfully giving him credit for, you know, what was a kind of surprising and underrated part of what was able to make this offense tick. Um, and that was kind of the theme of the offense, both in, you know, the red zone, how they've kind of been all year. And with Darian Mensa's performance, the kind of, uh, whole theme of it was, you know, kind of these unsung heroes and people needing to step up in unsurprising ways. Uh, it was very clear from the get-go that maybe, you know, Bill Belichick's, his whole thing was shut down. Don't let a team beat you with their best player, make them have to beat you with everyone else on the field, but don't let them beat you with, you know, their strength. And so it, it was pretty obvious that the whole game plan was to shut down Makai Hughes, who, I mean, he still amassed an absurd amount of carries in that game and was finally rightfully award. I think it's the Doak Doak Walker award. I should have looked that up before uh, semifinalist for his output the last couple of games. And he wasn't even on the, the preseason watch list to start off with that. But I think he had 23 carries in the game. Um, and I have that somewhere in front of me. If I had a brain, he had 22 carries for 82 yards and two rushing touchdowns. The fact that like the conversation here is, Oh, it's kind of, you know, a, slow day for Makai Hughes um, where he's had seven, a hundred yard games this season. He had five in a row. Um, you know, this ended that streak prior to that in a 15 game span, Tulane played three games against North Texas and Charlotte and Temple. And he had 76 carries in those three games and had 465 rushing yards, five rushing touchdowns again in a span of 15 days. Then they come up and, and play this bruiser of Navy that uh, clearly the whole thing was to shut him down. Um, it, that's something I've kind of been waiting for all season long, but at the same time, I remember I asked Tyler Grubbs a question after the rice game where, you know, I said the offense wasn't really able to get it going this game and the defense made some stands and how important that was. And I, I like what he said, where, you know, the offense has won so many games for us this year. We figured it was time for us to win one for them. That was very much the theme of the cotton bowl team where, there were games where if one side couldn't get it done, you saw a stellar performance from the other side of the ball. And what I'm talking about here again is regards to a two rushing touchdown, 82 yard rushing performance. But you know, in the standard of Makai Hughes, he's had more dominating games. Um, and so in that kind of same light, you look to, well, what's kind of the response uh, to be able to get, get, get something going on offense. And just as complimentary of the offense and defense became the offense under Darian Mensa, where he w people have been talking about his ability to run all season long. Um, I think everyone's taken for granted how impressive his output as a redshirt freshman has really been and how incredible and difficult of a feat it really has been for him to pull off. Uh, I think that it's more impressive in a, a sign of true development and growth and greatness in a quarterback that it feels like he started to run on his terms where yeah, the sea was wide open for him to run. That was already the case a few times this year. And it wasn't, you know, it was kind of whether or not he could see it, whether or not he had the instinct to react in that moment and kind of like merging on a highway where if you don't react right away, or this is a horrible example, but if you're jaywalking um, and have an instinct to go, if you don't go right that second, you have to kind of wait. 
that's where, you know, in football, really poor analogy, but um, having that kind of hesitance of time, that that's all the, the difference in football. We saw I, just how quick Tulane's reaction time as a defense completely shut down Navy's offense. You could see the moment where it clicked for Darian Mensa, where they had had, I think, you know, they had punted twice, if not had, you know, a, a three and out in that perspective. And this was the um, time where on fourth down, Sam Howard intercepts it, forces a turnover, good field position for Tulane. He completes a really important pass to Dante Fleming. I want to say it was the first reception of the day, if not the first one that really mattered. Um, but then for that touchdown run, you know, it wasn't like they were in the red zone and he had a little bit to go. It's a 14-yard rushing touchdown, but from the sidelines, I, I could see the light bulb moment go off. But what was just as important as that light bulb reaction time was him taking off in that immediate second. And that kind of, I think he realized in that moment in time how lethal of a wrinkle that can be to his game, where all of a sudden, and John Summerall, Coach Summerall, he said after um, today, it's like, you know, I said he looked like Michael Vick. He didn't look like Michael Vick out there. But, you know, for what we had seen from him, that's the kind of growth that you were talking about, where he had what was arguably a second rushing touchdown. Uh, the, the replay was certainly unclear. And the fact that they weren't going to review it in the first place, uh, I appreciate that John Summerall, you know, wanted to challenge that. But to me, I, I think what was as valuable, if not more, is his reaction and his instinct on some third and fourth and short situations to do exactly what his predecessor and, you know, what I've, we've really learned to be a true mentor in Michael Pratt and convert those fourth and shorts with your legs where, you know, you no longer have to think about subbing out Darian for Ty Thompson. If you know, you're going to run in those situations, if he starts to kind of have that instinct and go with it, but now, you know, that he's not going to do it as uh, you know, a consequence or to a detriment of his development as a passer, because it, it's very clear that that switch clicked in his head and it clicked on his terms. And as much as he's kind of been, you know, the coaching staffs wanted that out of him all year, hell of a time to really have that breakthrough. And you could just see it translate to his confidence and settling in, in that game where that was the difference maker to me, where even though there was the win was certainly a factor in the passing game. I really don't want to undermine how big of wind gusts there were. And I was looking up the weather report in real time as I do in our pregame segments. And I thought that I was reading it wrong where it said wind gusts up to 25 miles per hour. Uh, and they were, it was coming through the stadium quite a bit. I mean, the opening kickoff, I think rolled off the thing twice, if not the one after halftime, I think it was after halftime kicking to Tulane, but I, there was a pass to Yul Keith Brown and I rewatched the game on TV. It does not even show uh, if for some reason in the broadcast at all, how much that pass just like died in the air and completely deflated and fell to the ground. Like I was standing with some two lane people. We all were like, I don't think I've ever seen a pass actually just drop out of the sky like that. Um, you know, it was it, kind of like something was shot with a BB gun. I don't know why I'm being so aggressive in my term or my, comparisons here all that to say it was so weird and bizarre and I had asked Darian about this talking with him in a, a sit down for a Sports Illustrated exclusive I wrote last week I had mentioned the fact that the Temple game yeah the win, win wasn't as ba bad but it was a factor and the rain wasn't that bad but it was drizzling the whole time and he kind of underplayed how much of that was a factor and maybe it was but I, I think the fact that he's been able to adjust and the fact that Yolman is an outdoor stadium that deals with wind relatively often, including throughout practices that mattered in his confidence to be able to adjust in the passing game. But I think his confidence also came from him kind of realizing in real time, I could really be a dual threat out here. And that's as much as you could ask for uh, as a response to maybe trying as hard as they could to shut down Makai Hughes, who again, still had an incredible output. And I have, Parker Waters, the team photographer, caught you know a great image of what was one of the most impressive rushing touchdowns I've seen. Where there was no way he should have gotten from where he was stopped to being in the end zone, and just kind of almost in the robotic way. I remember him picking up Michael Pratt in the 2023 season opener when he was stuffed for a loss and tossing him five yards upfield. He just almost started kind of crawling on his elbows to make sure that he was able to to stay up and get over. You know, maybe not his elbows, but crawling on his hands to make sure that no part of his body touched before he stuck his hand over to, you know, again, have that level of situational awareness is the more impressive to me than a 100 yard game for him at the end of the day and how important that was. And then what was really unexpected out of that running back room as well was 
I don't think anyone had Arnold Barnes as a receiving touchdown on their bingo cards. And it's even more impressive to hear about Alex Bauman being the second receiving touchdown in that, you know, he tweaked something pregame and wasn't sure if he would be able to go. And if so, you know, going kind of in a, a limited setting, he was wide open. Um, but, you know, that's really what I think has made Tulane so unpredictable is it's I, I'd have to go back and look at least the last couple of weeks, the leading receivers, they're not the ones that are getting the touchdowns. And yeah, sometimes that has been the case, I think against Charlotte, but being able to really be that unpredictable. And it was such a good read by Darian Mensa and patience in the pocket, but Arnold Barnes has not been the most surefire receiver for Tulane. And for him to step up in that moment and make that crucial grab, you know, again, we're talking about a game where Tulane could have scored one time and won the game. They could have kicked a field goal and won the game. Does the defense still get a shutout? That's kind of why this whole conversation becomes meaningless. But, you know, that game was about, you know, Tulane winning it for themselves and taking advantage of every red zone opportunity they could get. And to be able to do it in such a creative fashion and then have such really key receivers. You know, I was so impressed by Dante Fleming. Uh, he got hurt in the game, tweaked his knee. He was practicing today. He was a warrior in that game and how much he was running on the sidelines, trying as best as he could to get back in that game. He came back. You know, he went back off the field, tried a different brace, readjusted. I mean, it's just been really incredible to watch those wide receivers just kind of you know, grow into these really tough guys. And Shaz Preston, I mean, for having limited catches at this point, I, I think he just has the two. Th they've been as crucial and incredible and impressive that you could think of and just adds yet another wrinkle here in week going into what will be week 13 for Tulane taking on Memphis. Yes, they're eventually going to take on Army, but I, I subscribe to the rat poison at this point. It gets Tulane to where they are, and that's really not on the table at this point. What's on the table is Memphis, and it's comfortable knowing that, yeah, you've locked up a spot in the conference title, but just as we saw that focus in the Navy game, what I think is going to be as important to seeing you know, really what Tulane's run is going to look like this year is making sure that they apply that same level of urgency and intensity to this matchup against Memphis, but if I've learned anything all year long, it's that John Summerall has his finger on the pulse on how to motivate. And he might not realize, you know, how psychologically rewarding that edge really is by the weekly mantra being something different for each opponent. I think it just brings a level of focus and importance and respect to every single opponent they faced this year. You look back at all the close wins Tulane had about uh, against common opponents. The situations were completely different. The teams were completely different, but this was a group of guys that really didn't know each other or play that much time together as a whole going into this season. And, you know, it, it's just as a much of a testament to the coaching staff and the players, but you know, you look at John Summerall and it, it's not a fluke at this point. It, it, it's a fluke in the sense of, I don't know why he's even lost the two games, but he started all three years as a head coach one and two, and his teams haven't lost a game since. And if you don't think that again, that last win against Memphis is the most important win for Tulane all season long, then you're not really getting what this culture is under Coach Summerall here. And the buy-in, it's been so expedited. And it's really been fascinating to watch this year, you know, from a sideline reporter's perspective, to see the challenge of having to replace Willie Fritz be such a blip in the rear mirror and see everything come full circle in Annapolis in the way that it did. I, I mean, that really is magic in college football. And no matter what, this is a team that's firing on all cylinders and that they're poised to really, you know, they, they have the mindset of champions. If they match that same mindset, mentality, discipline and approach against Memphis, I, I really don't know who can stop this team.